Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, Many, but not all of those who have died in service to country, died because they were doing what they felt, what they were convinced to be right. They were convinced because of what they knew of the word of God and what better way to honor a largely inclusive group who honored the word of God and who even though it wasn't on the mission field and even though it wasn't in the church pulpit or some other place, still, some gave all. So to honor that and the memory, we'll honor the word of God. Thy word is a lamp to my feet. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path alway, to guide and to save me from sin, and show me the heavenly way. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee, that I might not sin, that I might not sin, thy word have I hid.
thou art my portion, O Lord, and shall be through all my days. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. sin that I might not sin him against thee. Amen. Thank you for those specials. It is good to stand and read God's word with people present. I can't get over it. Second Kings chapter six. We're going to look at the first seven verses. You may be familiar with this uh, account in the scripture. But we're going to look at. The subject today, have you lost your cutting edge? 2 Kings, chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. We read, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Now this event took place in 8th century B.C. And there are many people in this Bible story, but there are two main characters. There is an unnamed prophet, student, and the prophet Elisha. You remember that Elisha had once been a student of Elijah. And when Elijah was taken away to heaven in a chariot, uh, like horses of fire, Elisha became God's chosen successor. And Elisha was given, God richly, richly blessed his ministry, giving him a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. Now, Elisha's prophetic ministry lasted 50 years and was characterized by many exciting miracles. And in fact, there was even a miracle after he died when uh, there was a, they coming across and they threw a man that had died into his, because they were under attack and he hit Elisha's bones and that man raised up. So Elisha had miracles even after he was, he was dead. But the, last, the text that we read here today, 2 Kings chapter uh, 6, begins telling us of a problem that the young seminary students had. That's exactly who the sons of the prophets were, by the way. They were young prophets who were, who were learning, who were being taught, uh, in this case, by the prophet Elisha. And we find that they had a problem because the building that they were meeting in uh, for Elisha to teach them in was too narrow. It says too straight. So the students asked permission uh, of their trusted teacher, Elisha, to go to the area around the Jordan River where there were a lot of trees so they could build a larger place to live. And the plan was for each student to cut one beam of wood, each for the building expansion. This is the first college dormitory that the Bible talks about, by the way. So we see that the prophet Elisha said, hey, that's great, go do it, you know. <laughs> and so in our text, we see that there was a, a really a mindful trust. Elisha thought the students were mature enough to engineer the building uh, for a new place to live. 
but they didn't want to be without their teacher. So one of the young seminary students says, Elisha, won't you come with us? And he said, I'll go. So Elisha and these young students uh, head toward the Jordan River to build a new college campus. And when they arrived, they immediately began to work cutting down trees. Each student was doing his part. And all of a sudden, one of the young students, when he was cutting down a tree, his iron axe head flew off the handle, and it fell into the Jordan River, and it wasn't even his, it was borrowed. Sunk straight to the bottom, as iron is known to do. So the young student who lost his axe head lost his, his cutting edge. He, he lost his effectiveness to do the work at hand. And I want us to think about that for a moment. You know, all of us have been successful in respective choices of work. You've probably done work for the Lord, and you can be assured there's no greater work in the world than, than building up the kingdom of God. No greater. But have we ever lost our cutting edge while serving the Lord? Have we ever lost our effectiveness in doing the Lord's work? And I think this is important because we've had kind of had a, a stay, right? There's been a, a, a kind of a, a freeze put on things, it seems, when it comes to the work of God. We couldn't meet together. By the way, let me just say that we have never stopped being church. We've, we, we've been stopped from meeting together as we are today. But as a church, we should have never, never stopped. But I think because of this freeze, sometimes we might have lost our cutting edge lost our effectiveness to do the work. and Because uh, at one time in life, we were working with great strength and vigor, and the chips were flying in all directions, and we were knocking down tree after tree and building up the kingdom of God. But I'm going to tell you, if we've lost our cutting edge for the Lord, we need to ask God to help us to get it back. And there are a couple things I believe this passage teaches us that might help us get back our cutting edge for Jesus. First, like the young seminary student in our text, we're going to have to admit that we've lost our cutting edge. The first step this young student had to take was to admit that he no longer had his cutting edge. It had slipped off the axe handle and it flew into the Jordan River and sank to the bottom of the flowing current. He was busy doing important work for God, but suddenly he was no longer being effective at it. To admit that we have a problem... It's the first step in many programs, isn't it? You know, uh, is it, and, and, and we'll tell you, it's the most difficult step of all. We can see many examples around us where admitting that one has a problem is the first step of a healing process. For example, you know, the, the, the AA program, the first thing is that you have to admit you have a problem with alcohol. As with any addiction, that's the first thing you have to admit. Mine is, I have, you know what, I have a problem with eating. So I have to admit that, first of all, before I'll go and do something about it. And I am working on that, by the way. So the young student could have reached, at, reached and uh, reacted in a lot of different ways. I mean, he, instead, of, instead of saying, oh, I have a problem, he could have been happy that he lost his axe head. You know, he could have just used this as an excuse to just stop working for God altogether. And a lot of people have done that today. They've lost their cutting edge and they said, you know what, I just quit. It's easy now, you know. You know, he could, he could have found a nice, cool shade tree and poured himself a glass of iced tea and, and just watched the fellow students do all the work. <laughs> On the other hand, he could have refused to admit that there was a problem, that he, could, that he even lost his axe head. You know, he could say, what problem? I don't have a problem. <laughs> he could have just kept swinging that wooden stick without the iron axe head mounted on the end, just going through the motions of cutting down trees, making a lot of noise, but never accomplishing anything. And did you catch the part where the young student said, oh no, it was borrowed. Iron axes were rare, okay, in these days. Not to mention, pretty expensive. And so this man was a young seminary student and doubted that he had very little money. I know I didn't when I was in seminary. My brother Charles probably tell you the same thing. Probably when he was a young seminary student, probably wasn't just flow rolling cash, wasn't rolling in. So if someone had not loaned him the axe, he wouldn't have been able to do the work in the first place. 
And I want us to think about that and consider the fact that all of our abilities, all of our resources, all of our talents are just borrowed from the Lord. They're on loan to us. So remember, God has not given us permission to stop working for Him until we get to home with Him. <laughs> That's when we can rest. So if we've lost our cutting edge for the Lord doing His work, the first thing we have to say is, you know what? I have a problem. I'm not as effective as I used to. I'm not, I, I don't have that, that cutting edge anymore. Then like the young seminary student, we need to determine the exact spot where we lost the cutting edge. Have you ever had a problem with misplacing things? <laughs> you know, of course, when you hear of someone losing uh, something like their car keys, the first thing you say, hey, where was the last place you had them? <laughs> yeah. Where was the last place you remember having them? And that's exactly what Elisha asked the young student when the student said, hey, I lost the axe head and it was borrowed. And Elisha said, well, where did you lose it? Where did it fall? And you know from personal experience, a really good way to find something is try to remember where you had it last. The young student didn't plan on losing his cutting edge. It just happened. And isn't that the way it is with us? You know, somewhere along the road, we just have a tendency to lose our, our, our contribution to the building of the kingdom of God. And so like that young student in our text, we didn't plan for it to happen, somewhere along the line, it just did. As a matter of fact, something similar happened to the Apostle Peter in the New Testament. Peter said to Jesus, hey, everybody else is going to stop serving you. I don't care. They're going to do I'm never going to stop, right? And then one day, that rooster crowed, and Peter realized, you know what? I did. I stopped serving. Wow. I denied Christ. And so, by the way, when we had a rooster in our form, you know, if you ever had a rooster, you know uh, that when that thing goes off, you, you're awake, right? You know it's going to wake you up. And that's what the purpose of that rooster crowing. It woke Peter up and said, you know what? I've messed up. I've messed up. And if we ever get to the point where we've lost our cutting edge in doing God's work, we need to remember that our cutting edge is right where we left it. <laughs> and maybe we need to ask some other questions like, why did I lose my cutting edge? Why? Was it because I dropped out of Sunday school? Because I didn't think it was important? I thought it was overrated? Was it because I stopped attending worship services on a regular basis? Which we were, you know, that's where we were, right? just a few weeks ago, so some, that could cause us to lose a little bit of our effectiveness, of our edge, if we're not careful. Was it because I became angry with someone or jealous of someone? Well, did we lose our cutting edge because we stopped praying or stopped reading our, our Bible on a regular basis? Did we lose our, our cutting edge for the Lord because we, we were failing to witness to someone in His name? Did we lose, and this is a very, very important question, did we lose our cutting edge because of personal sin entangled in our lives? These are all pertinent questions we need to ask if we've, lo if we've lost that edge, if we've lost that effectiveness. Where did we lose it? Why did we lose it? Have you lost your cutting edge for God because you haven't been giving Him of yourself or a portion of of your talents or resources. Because I'm going to tell you if, you, have, if you have the courage to take a, a deep and serious look at your personal spiritual life, you can discover where and why you've lost your cutting edge to the service of the Lord. So when the, when the young seminary student lost his cutting edge, he first had the courage to say, hey, I've lost this. I don't have my cutting edge anymore. And then he determined the exact place that he lost it. And then he did something else. He did his part in recovering the cutting edge. Think about this. Elisha was not a magician. He was a chosen prophet of Almighty God. The power that Elisha had to perform miracles wasn't Elisha's power. It was power from God. 
And so the miracle on the part of Elisha not only shows us that Elisha was concerned about this young student's problem, but more importantly, this miracle shows us that God was deeply concerned with this student's problem. I think this miracle clearly illustrates some basic truths about the God we serve. First, God is deeply concerned with you and me as individuals. See, there were an entire company of young prophet students cutting down trees that day, but God took the time to help the one that had a problem. God is deeply concerned with the individual. And, and we see that in Jesus' teaching about the lost sheep and the lost coin and the prodigal son. Remember? You and I are very valuable to God. We're so valuable to God that he said he created us in his own image. There's another truth here, and that's that God, with God there are no problems too small to bring to his attention. I think we discussed this not too, not too long ago. There's obviously none too big. And we come to him with those all the time. But there's none too small. We should go to him with the, the small things. You know, oh, I don't want to bother God. You're not bothering God. He's, he's omnipotent. You're not bothering God. He hears and sees everyone, everyone all the time. And he hears you. And he wants to hear from you. When you have problems, whether you think they're big problems or you think they're little insignificant problems, there are no such things with God. If they're a problem to you, he wants to hear about it, whether you think they're insignificant or not, whether anyone else thinks they're insignificant or not. No problem too small. You know what 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Do you have a problem or concern today? The question is, have you cast that problem or concern to God? See, a man losing an axe head might not seem like a big deal. I mean, after, we're, after all, there were hundreds of others there cutting down trees, and the building could have gotten done. The work could have been completed. But God was concerned about this one because this one had a part. I'm going to tell you, not only does he care about you and is concerned about your problems, but he's going to help you solve your problems so that in turn you can honor and glorify him. God is going to cause the solution to float to the surface. Let's talk about what this young student did to get his cutting edge back. His work didn't end when he realized he had a problem. His work didn't end when he sought out help from the prophet Elisha. See, Elisha had the power, a spiritual gift from God, to make that axe, fled, that, that axe head float to the top of the water. And then he could have, he could have had it fly straight back on uh, to the wooden handle, uh, but he didn't do that. He could have. And why do you suppose Elisha didn't just do that? Hey, I fixed the problem. Everything's good. It's because God wanted this young man to be involved in his own recovery. God wanted him to reach out his hand and recover the axe head himself. We have to be honest with ourselves this morning. We have to take a, a serious look at our cutting edge and, and doing the work uh, that God has assigned us in his kingdom. Have we adopted the motto of the world when it comes to the thing of the church? See, the motto of the world this day seems to be, what can this church do for me? I see it all the time when inviting people. Well, what do you have to offer? You know, it was nearly, well, it's been year, many years. I don't even want to get Many years ago when President John F. Kennedy gave, won the election uh, by giving an American public an unforgettable speech, and in that speech, these famous words, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. 
And today we live in a culture which has swung completely the opposite direction and says, what will you do for me, government? <laughs> what are you going to do for me, the people? And I'm going to tell you, far too many Christians look at the local church as a place to be served rather than a place of service. Many Christians look today at the church and say, hey, what kind of programs do you have for me and my family? And if you don't have pro programs uh, on the services that I like, I'm just going to go down the road to somebody who will, who will cater to me. I ask the Lord to help us get back in the saddle of personal service to Him and hold on to our cutting edge. You know, this is a, a great text. I, I'm glad it's in the Bible. But do you, do you know that this young student could have avoided all his problems if he had just checked his axe head occasionally before he started? If he had checked the axe head to see that it was firmly attached to the axe handle, he would have seen that, hey, this isn't quite like it should be. And he could have done a quick and easy repair, and he wouldn't have lost any time in his work. So it reminds us that we too need to check out our spiritual tools on a regular basis. <laughs> this question is when the last time did you do that? When's the last time we, we checked our spiritual equipment? Because when you check out your spiritual inventory on a regular basis, you can make the minor adjustments that you need to to keep on serving the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you what the devil wants. He'll prefer that you look at your spiritual life and, and, and never, and I mean, never look at your spiritual life until it's too costly to repair <laughs> and too much damage has been done. But I'm going to tell you, it's not too late for you to make necessary repairs here and now. Because if you're here today or you're listening today and you're a Christian, God wants you to be an effective servant in His kingdom. I mean, many times it says, hey, bear fruit. But he wants you to be effective. There's no doubt about it. But I'm going to tell you, if you check out your iron, your iron axe head, your spiritual service, it's going to make your spiritual service, uh, make sure everything's okay with your personal relationship with God. Make sure that's right. Make sure you're not swinging away with a wooden stick without an axe head. Huh? Going through motions, making a lot of noise, but no effectiveness. It's kind of like uh, the rain clouds that make thunder and no rain, you know. But check out your spiritual inventory. And if there's need, prayers need to be made, make them. Ask God for help. Ask a spiritual advisor, as this man did, for help. Hey, I need to get back on track. Hey, I need some help getting back. Maybe, maybe you need some accountability partner. Maybe you need someone to pray with you. Maybe you need someone to have a Bible study with you. Huh? Till you get back in the habit of doing it on your own at all times. And if you're here today or listening today and not a Christian, Jesus today is extending to you his personal invitation of mercy and grace. And we just pray that you'll respond to him. We pray that, that you'll know without a doubt this morning. That's always my prayer, that you know without a doubt this morning that Jesus Christ went to the cross and he died for your sins. That he was buried and on the third day he rose from the dead victorious and triumphant. And he offers his ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice of his life's blood on the cross as full payment for all your sins. And so if this is a decision you haven't made in your heart, I encourage you, I urge you to make this decision for Jesus this morning. Because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, if you believe in your heart, right, that God's raising from the dead, you can be saved. The Bible says, for with heart is where you believe, right? And you confess with your mouth, <laughs> and you're saved. No maybes, no could be's, just a simple fact. You will be saved if you trust in Jesus Christ. Let us bow. 
our God and our Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, who is the only way to heaven. I know there's many that teach different things. Many think you can be good enough, but no one can. Many think you can just be baptized, but baptism just gets you wet if it's not picturing what you've already done in your heart, which is died to sin by accepting God's sacrifice of His Son on the cross as payment for said sin. Lord, I can't save anyone. But Lord, help me every day to show them what it means to be saved. And be ready at a moment's notice to lead them to the one who can, and that's Jesus Christ. Lord, we're so grateful for those who have died for our freedoms over the many years. But most of all, we're so thankful for Jesus who died once and for all, for all sinners like me. Lord, take your words today. May your spirit move upon each one that's heard your word. And if they're not saved, Lord, today, I pray that they will seek you out, that they will know the truth. Lord, they will too have a home in heaven as I do because I have trusted Christ as my Savior for He's the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Go with us today. Help us be the witness that you want us to be. Help us to check daily our spiritual inventory and make sure our lives are right with you so that we can show others the way to you. For ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you again for assembling with us today and listening. If you are live, that's great. If not, hey, you can go back and see it sometime and, and pick up anything you missed and take notes if you want on Facebook Live. But before we leave, I want to announce that next week we'll do the same thing. The last Sunday of, of May, we'll uh, come at 1045 and have our worship service. But following uh, the next week in June, the first week in June, we'll come back for some Sunday school. We'll have a little open more area. Uh, and uh, so we can still practice the, the distance that we need to do um, and uh, just pray for one another and reach out to one another and let everyone, and then invite someone else. We have plenty of room to bring anybody you want to bring to church. So until that time, thank you again for being here today, and may God bless you all.